Hello, I am Jamie Bauer uh, from Stranger Things and other projects and music. And I'm hanging out with Rob on Front Row Life. Jamie, what's up, man? It's really good to reconnect with you. Now, I'm going to start it off with saying, um, for me, when I first met you, that was my first introduction to Counterfeit, and I fell in love with the band, and it was such an incredible run that you guys have had. But regardless with everything going on with the band, I love that you're still doing music, because I think one of the things that I really fell in love with was your songwriting and your voice. Um, and I love that that's what you're, you're doing now with, with your music today. So transitioning from this whole band aspect to now being a solo artist, like what was that transition like for you? Did you feel like it was a natural process? Yeah, it was fairly, um, it was fairly seamless if I'm being honest. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure, I'm sure I mentioned this It's it's been a minute since I've looked at our old interview, uh, but, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I've always, I've always played music. I've always written, whether that be, you know, with a band or by myself. And Counterfeit was like very much born. Um, you know, I, I remember saying this, but like, I, you know, I started writing that first record, you know, on my own in my apartment in London um, between, you know, doing other things that, that I was doing at the time. So, the idea of sort of transitioning to solo was has, it was never sort of I was never fearful of it at all. It just kind of seemed like it was the right thing to do. I was never gonna put this down. I I, I I've never had any inclination to do anything other than be creative um, in 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 whatever sphere that is. So it's been great. You know, I I feel like in a way it's it's really allowed me the opportunity to kind of explore a bit more and there's it's interesting as i'm going on this journey this musical journey and, and I, I i've always had the story that i wanted to tell and um and this allows me the opportunity to tell that story but musically i'm i'm sort of exploring two different worlds at the minute there's there's one world that is very um sort of you know like gospel bluesy kind of southern rock kind of thing um which i adore and have always adored and then there's this other side of it where i'm sort of pushing the boundaries of what we consider to be possible i suppose where so i'm using a lot of um a lot of kind of synth elements kind of spatial audio sounds with more classic rock elements but leaning more towards this idea of creating like a sonic landscape with it so you know there's 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 sort of weird kind of trippy electronic elements with big guitars that sound a bit like sun o so i'm kind of you know i'm straddling these two worlds at the moment and what i've put out thus far you know has been both, you know, sort of in this Nick Cave kind of Leonard Cohen world with strings that I love. And then I've done this sort of gospel thing. And then, I'm, you know, I've got other stuff that I'm working on that is more in that sort of like blend of all things. Um, and I'm, I'm just excited to kind of explore and open up, but it all feeds into this story that I want to tell, which is loosely based on the um on the on Dante's Inferno and the idea of the nine circles of hell and the journey into the abyss and into darkness as it were to find out the truth of who I am and who we are and I feel like the world exists in this very like frantic chaotic space that I want to draw people into this space of like feeling more um and i'll use whatever i can you know both musical elements and visual elements to tell that story um and it's really exciting you know i i have i have some great partners that i'm working with i'm, I'm working with locomotion um who uh represent um uh young blood and 
um, wargasm, uh, and and you know they they are you know an independent publisher, and 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 they've been very, you know, lovely to allow me the space to explore in Five B, who, you know, manage, you know, Slipknot and Amon Amarth and Neck Deep, and and you know, so I'm in I'm in I feel like I'm in beautiful hands with people who just want to make really interesting cool stuff and we're not worried about the commerciality of it at all which is really nice because that's where I come from is I come from I come from picking up a guitar or you know sitting down at the piano and just bashing things out and going well there you go like let's just sling it out there it's much more DIY than kind of having to be like oh well I've got to do this and it's got to service this need and that need and whatever else it just feels a lot more pure to me now which is how counterfeit started as well um and it's where i started so yeah sorry that was a very long-winded answer to a probably a very easy question classic me but no <laughs> but but see like that's the <laughs> that's the thing though because on our first interview you definitely like left a really incredible impression because i don't know if you remember but like the interview ended up getting bumped a little later um when I got there and the reasoning was because you were in this creative like mental space and trying to work out a song. And the moment that, uh, that your team told me that I was just like, see, this is why this guy, like, no matter what he's doing with me, no matter what he's doing, music comes first. And like, it kind of, it bleeds into what you create, but that, statement alone just like i don't know it like it stuck to me because I, like no one's ever said like i'm in this mental or i'm in this creative space like let me finish it and and deal with it and that was amazing like i i don't even know how else to explain it but that was like that was pretty amazing and you're kind of mentioning it now with like because of the person you are musically i feel like all the right people are coming to you as far as like management as far as publishing as far you know as far as the right teams yeah, a hundred percent. And and I think, you know, for me, music and art in general um comes from comes from a very vulnerable and sensitive place, whether that be, you know, loud guitar driven music or whether it be something that's, you know, more um, you know, I suppose sonically sensitive um and that those spaces are very um fragile it's a very fragile it's a very fragile state um and so to to know that it's important that i need that it, it has been a blessing you know and and that bleeds into all creative aspects of my life across everything um i'm not the person that <clears throat> would has their phone on in the studio uh, you know i'm not the person that takes their phone to 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 set you know unless i'm just listening to music and if i'm listening to music it's going to be on airplane mode and i'm going to make sure that i've downloaded everything that i need beforehand um so so yeah it, it, and 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 that you know that also bleeds into the recording process as well and and making sure that whatever vibe we're trying to capture at that moment is maintained um, is you're trying, I'm trying to capture uh, a reality and a live element to everything that I do and a living element, you know, sound, <clears throat> sound is waves, right? It's, 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 it's effectively, you know, matter and, um, and, and, and so whatever I play through that guitar or whatever comes out of my mouth is a feeling and can make other people feel. And if I'm not 100% focused on it, then somebody's going to pick up on that. And I would rather give them this raw, unfiltered, unadulterated version than something that was kind of phoned in you know right right and I, I guess that's kind of what you did with run on uh vocally um it's basically that raw initial take correct 
Correct. Yeah, it's one. It's one vocal take. Um, you know, the stomp, the stomp claps were were done. The, the stomp claps that are on there are the stomp claps that I used from the demo that I, that I recorded on the demo. So I was like, I'm taking that. That happened. That's what we're using. Anything else? Like I don't give a shit. It can sound crappy. I don't care. Um, <clears throat> and then the vocal take is all one take recorded through. Um, what's called a bullet mic um, or a ball and biscuit mic, um, which you know Jack White made most notably famous with his with his work both in the White Stripes and I think also um, a lot of the solo stuff and, and possibly even the raconteurs as well. Um, and then you know with the full band element, um, that's all live. That's one take, um, and it's you know it, it's the take that we shot the video. Um, at, and I was fortunate enough to have a couple of like, you know, some great musicians in the room, Mikey Demas and Aria Goggin from Skin Dread, um, you know, they're, 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 and they've got their own thing, um, King Sugar now, um, you know, those guys are amazing. Aria is a very, um, a, a very both intelligent and also restrained drummer, which I really like, like he's not trying to sort of like show off too much. He's just you know, it, it's that classic thing. It's the Ringo way of playing almost, you know, it's like service the song, don't service yourself, um, which is really cool. And Mikey's a phenomenal guitar player and um, and really pulled something out of himself in that session that, uh, that I think he was really proud of. And, and I know I was particularly proud of, you know, he spent he spent a minute like, trying to figure something out that was like super technical and blah, 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 all of this. And I saw this happening and I was just kind of left him to it. And, you know, I come back and he shows me and I'm like, that's great. That's fine. But now play from your heart, be BB King, like show me, show me your BB King. Let's see that. Let's see what that does. And that's all one take. And that's what we used, you know, across everything, um, which is just phenomenal. So it's not, you know, it, it, it's not perfect, but there's beauty in the imperfection and that's what I really really like I, I would rather something sounded raw and real um than processed and um and, and just it loses its loses its identity I think now we're so used to we're so used to things being so processed that music becomes very safe and I don't want it to be safe. It doesn't need to be safe. It's, it's a bunch of human beings getting together and doing something that's, um, that's, it's just of the moment and present in that time, you know, and that's great. Yeah. We need to be able to feel that emotion, that, that, that pain that comes out of your vocals or, you know, that whatever that you felt during that writing or recording process, like you want the audience to also feel it the same way. Um, and I feel like you did this with this song. Now, I love that it's a reimagined version. Uh, what kind of kickstarted that for you? Um, did you were you guys just in a session and it happened, or was it something that you came into it uh, with it in mind? I came into it. I mean, it's funny. I was like, I was away. I was on vacation, and you know, I love Johnny Cash and. I it just kept coming up in my mind it just wouldn't go away for like two days and I was like um you know my my partner went to the gym <laughs> and I was sat at my computer and just went for it and like you know I've mentioned already that the stomp claps are from the demo there's also there's also like I put some sand in a like a plastic bottle and that's still on there too. It's all, you know, if you listen, if you got, if anyone ever got the stems, you'd be able to hear things in the background. It's all very rough. Um, and, um, and so I was just like, I've just got to do this and, you know, feeling into that more like Southern rock blues element. I always saw the opportunity to kind of blow it up and make it bigger and make it more explosive and more expansive. And so I sort of roughly penned, I didn't have a guitar with me at all. So I sort of like, like roughly penned some, some chords down that I thought, okay, well, this is the structure of what it should be and some shitty drums and, and, um, and then uh, and sort of sent it to Matt Terry, who who um, who runs Vader Studios in in England. And I was like, Matt, I, I really want to do this. Do you know any musicians that are available? 
have you got space in the studio next week? And do you know any, like, do you know a drummer or any guitarists that are available? And we'd already spoken about Mikey because Mikey and I, you know, we're, we're going to potentially do some writing together and all of this kind of stuff. And we'd met on FaceTime and uh, I was like, he was like, yeah, yeah, these boys are, they're available and they would love to do it. So, you know, we weren't in a session. We literally got to the studio, ran it a few times, kind of just pulled it out. Mikey worked on that thing. And then we came back and, it was like, all right, let's go. Like, we're ready to go. So it was all done in a day, you know, the whole thing. And then we mixed up the SSL board at like two in the morning. Um, I was like, you know, I, I feel like nowadays people are so eager to mix, you know, in the box on the computer. And I was like, well, we've got this beautiful desk from the 90s. Like, what the f are we doing here, man? Like, this is so awesome. Let's use this. Um which we did and, and we wrapped it up at two in the morning and just went for it. So it's got this kind of frenetic, instinctual realness to it, um, you know, that we just captured on the day. And that was the first time we played together and we haven't played together since. <laughs> it's great. I love it. I love musicians. I love people who just do. And it's, um, it, there's something, there's so much to be said for that. So that's kind of how it all came to be, but it was very much just, it wouldn't leave my mind. And, and that's beautiful because I can write in two ways. You know, one way is when something gets stuck in there and I'm like, okay, that's got to be done. And then the other way is kind of just like allowing myself to be fully open and fully receptive in that moment to write something. Um, and this was one of those things that was like, no, 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 it's, this has to be done. You, you have to do this. And it's the same with the B side too, with devil and me, you know, I, I wrote that, I wrote that as I was preparing for, 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 for the show and I'd never kind of tracked it. I never recorded it. I just had it. And then I called Martin Tarife, who I'd worked with in London. And I was like, Martin, I, I've got this song, um, you know, it, I, it's no frills. Like I want it to feel like, it's recorded at, uh, at Sun Studios and I want to use old gear and he has an old Trident um, ATB desk um, by Martin Toft and, and that's in London. It's that sort of classic British sound. And again, you know, that's, that's all kind of mixed up the board using mics from, you know, from the 50s and 60s. And, and, and it was just what it was, you know, we did three takes and used the first. Yeah, man, why not? <laughs> You know, why not? Why not if you can? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's, it, it's unreal because it's like these kinds of, this way of recording, it's like you really have to nail it. It's not even about how much money it's going to cost you. It's more about like that analog tape. <laughs> so it's like you really have to nail it within those first couple of takes, but three takes, that's insane. Yeah, it's great. I loved it. You know, and the third take, I felt like I was presenting a version of myself that wasn't as honest as the first take. There's a level of sort of like fear in there and there's a level of sort of heartbreak and and, and worry. And, and that's really beautiful and, and it's very vulnerable. And I, and I was like, that's exactly what it should be. I can sit here and analyze this until the cows come home, but actually like this is perfect and it's exactly what it's meant to be in that moment and that's totally fine and and i love that way of recording i i, I think it's i think you really get in those moments and when you track and you work like that what you're dealing with is the song and that's it like nothing else matters at that point and 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 that's the music that we love you know we there's there's artists and it sounds like fucking trash but like it's real and like why not you know it's great um yeah yeah <laughs> and it's I, I love that you give us uh like a completely different level of vulnerability with this with this new music um just because going back and listening to um letters to the lost that's a different level of vulnerability but then now it's like this is more of you like you are the focus your voice is the focus the instrumentation is there, but it's not overbearing. Um, was this something that you felt was difficult to get used to um, at first, or was this also another natural just process for you? 
Both. <laughs> um, uh, it, 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 because it's so raw and like I say, you're dealing with the song. So for something like Paralyzed and Start the Fire, those two tracks, like I was just in this place of like total surrender. And it was terrifying. I, I felt like I wasn't, I, I, I sort of had this like whole out of body experience. And the same thing, you know, with, with those two string players, we'd never played together before. So what you're hearing on that tape, on those two songs is, is us again in the room, first time we're doing it. Um, so, you know, it, 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 there, there comes a level of sort of like total surrender open yourself up and be what it's going to, and it's going to be what it's going to be. And I'm figuring this out as I'm sort of going along now in this musical journey that, you know, if it ain't right and it ain't coming through, well, then it ain't right and it ain't coming through. Spin it off. Like it, it's not worth it. It's not, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter how much you can throw the kitchen sink at it and that's fine, but it's not gonna, it's not the song. The song isn't there. And the song is the most important thing. Um, and that's great. And I, and I love that. And, and, and I think people forget nowadays that that's the way music is created and that's the way music should be. It's the way it was, it's the way it used to be created. And, um, you know, Elvis, you know, Roy Orbison, you know, they didn't go into Sun Studios and go, yeah, well, I'll do the vocal and I'll track it and then we'll put a bunch of Melodyne on it. And then and then if it ain't working, it's OK, because we can dip this thing out and then we can put a swell in here. And it's and it's like, no, nah, man, like you got one chance, you know, you probably got three cuts and that's it. And I love that. I love the idea of three cuts and you're done. Like if it ain't there in three cuts, then it ain't right. Uh, Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And this whole thing of like, you know, you mentioned the word mix, you know, it's the same thing as filming. It's like when people say, oh, don't worry, we'll get it in the edit. Well, no, 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 no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I don't want to get this in the edit. I want to get this now. Um, and then the job of editing becomes easier. Um, so, um, it, it, you know, it, it's both a very vulnerable place to be. Um, terrifying um but also incredibly fulfilling when it's right it's incredibly fulfilling it's awesome you mentioned uh earlier that uh, on this interview that you um you want to kind of dive into the world of dante uh mm. with this material and ironically that's also the kind of role that you're playing on this show do these go, do these go hand in hand or did one come before the other? Like what, how did this come about? Or is it's just, just ironic that it's together? I, 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 I knows. Um, <laughs> I'm drawn. It's funny with creativity and creative projects. I'm, I'm never making conscious decisions about what I'm going to do and what I'm going to get. So when these things happen, they tend to kind of just line up and I don't question it. I'm like, okay, if that's happening, then that's great. And I totally dig that and I vibe that. Um, it is just pure, oh, I don't even know to call it irony. It's like, it's just external from me. It's not, it's, it's just th these things happen and I'm like, okay, if that's there, then that's there. And I love that. And I rate that. And I think also like the idea of Dante's Inferno and this idea of like journeying into hell, I think also it's this sort of metaphor. It's a metaphor in a way um, for this. I don't mean this in, I don't mean this like overall, because obviously there's, there's more to it and I don't want to, um, I don't want to like nullify it or dumb it down in any way because I feel like there's a lot more to it. But when I'm talking about the idea of darkness, sometimes I feel like sometimes that's a metaphor for sadness and for 
depression almost. And I feel like as a society, we're so afraid of those things. We're so, we, you know, we drug ourselves up to the eyeballs when we feel depressed, but that's a natural part of human existence. And until we learn how to deal with it and come out the other side of it, we're always going to fear it. But actually, it's in those moments of like deep despair and, 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 and occasionally suffering that we find out so much more about ourselves, so much more about who we are and that it's okay. You know, I've had countless conversations with friends of mine about like the first time we encountered that bottomless nothingness. And as I'm going along in this musical journey, I'm, I'm, I get to a point where I'm trying to describe the eternal blackness. And like, <laughs> how do you describe nothing? <laughs> like, how do you describe nothing? Um, so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's that side to it too, yeah. Well, that's definitely a challenge that I'm looking forward to uh, to watching you create and <laughs> and make happen. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we'll see if it appears. <laughs> well, Jamie, I could keep talking to you forever because I love everything that you that you say about music. But um, I'm gonna cut it with this last question and just you know, throughout this new musical journey of this solo experience. Uh, of Jamie Bauer, um, you know, what do you feel has been the biggest challenge that you've faced? Maintaining a sense of, of personal identity and not succumbing to the whims or the reactions of others. Yeah, it, that's, the, that's the biggest, most important factor, I think, of being wow. any musician is being un, like unashamedly who you are at any yeah. given moment. Yeah. Damn. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> well, dude, it's, it's great catching up with you. Um, thank you again for reuniting with me. Congratulations with the success of the music and obviously the show. And um, I'm looking forward to doing this again soon. I would love that, mate. Hopefully I'll, um, I'll be able to get you to some sort of spooky show somewhere in America soon. Yes, please. <laughs>